In this chapter, we will learn how governance of the ocean developed over the centuries. This inevitably requires an account of the norms that regulate interactions of humans with the oceans. Until very recently, it was only states who would make these rules. This has changed uh, a little to incorporate uh, other aspects and other state stakeholders. With regard to this chapter, it's very important to keep in mind that the history of human power over the oceans has been a constant struggle and balancing between the notion of freedom on the one hand and the push for coastal power over the other, over the oceans on the other hand. From the 17th century onwards until now, any progressive step in the law of the sea reflects on one of these two categories, either emphasizing freedom or emphasizing coastal states' power over the waters. In other words, states either aim at freedom, freedom of shipping, freedom of fishing, freedom of passage through straits, or on coastal power, exclusive rights, restricting passage, restricting fishery rights, and giving licenses, uh, uh, in uh, uh, sort of um, fixing the boundaries and controlling their maritime zone. Starting this development over two millennia ago, the Romans, for instance, considered running water, the coastal strip, the sea and the air to be not susceptible to trade. So individuals could not own it and uh, neither uh, what belonged to these categories. Yet the actual basis for our current marine governance system is to be found much later, when uh, humanity climbed out of the Middle Ages and Columbus sailed to the Americas in 1492. About half a year later, Pope Alexander VI divided the world between Spain and Portugal, with a line running from pole to pole a hundred leagues west of the Azores or Cape Verde Islands. Imagine the Pope saying, I divide the world and I give it to two states. You cannot imagine uh, something like that today. And not everybody liked it at that time. At that time, Spain and Portugal were the two major powers. Yet the situation began to change about a century later. From the end of the 16th century, ships sailed from the Republic of the Seven United Netherlands to what is uh, now known Indonesia to participate in the highly lucrative spice trade. Portugal arrested one of the ships and claimed that it had a monopoly on the trade in this part of the world. It was their part of the world, given to Portugal by the Pope. The Republic then hired a young lawyer named Hugo Grotius, who was to defend its case against Portugal. In short, he argued that the ocean is so vast that nobody can claim sovereignty over it. There would be no way to enforce that sovereignty anyway. So without any state sovereignty, everybody would be allowed to navigate and fish on the ocean, this being the most important users of the seas back then. Interestingly, freedom of the seas was already known around the Strait of Malacca about a thousand years earlier. It was exactly this concept that a local ruler in Sulawesi used as an argument against Dutch attempts to monopolize the spice trade only 13 years, 30 years after Grotius promoted freedom of the seas. This emphasizes that colonial powers just used the freedom of the high seas whenever it suited them. A fact highlighted by the local Sulawesi ruler who pointed out this not consistent behavior to the Dutch. Grotius' work became a subject of critique from mainly British lawyers. He promoted the idea of a closed sea as opposed to the freedoms. One reason for this was the rising power of the British Empire and consequently less, less need for freedoms. The British could exercise their jurisdiction one way or the other. So they extended their sovereignty and the more sovereignty they had, the less they were interested that other powers were crossing through their waters. By unilaterally abolishing the freedom of fishing, for example, the British hoped to get rid of foreign fishing vessels and what they regarded their waters. So it was all about economic power and sovereignty. So to say, extreme cases of national sovereignty over semi-enclosed seas occurred as well. Venice claimed the whole of the Adriatic Sea and Sweden, the Baltic. And more and more countries began to expand their jurisdiction over a strip of the ocean directly adjacent to their coasts and then claiming freedom of navigation for the rest of it. So we already have two concepts uh, combined here, sovereignty over certain parts and freedom for the rest. 
the strip of ocean water became to known as the territorial sea. The international community was only to agree upon it its exact breadth at the end of the 20th century. So for centuries, states have argued whether that should be three or six or 12 or 200 nautical miles. It makes quite a difference. A first proposal came from the Dutch lawyer Cornelis van Blankershoek, who stated that a coastal state might exercise sovereignty over that part of the sea that is within the reach of its cannon, his cannons. Over the years, the so-called cannon shot rule evolved and many states claimed a territorial sea up to three miles from their coastline, by then the reach of the most advanced cannons. The 19th century saw the start of big oil exploitation area, era, although at first the oil rigs stayed close to the coast or were even attached to it, soon they were moved out further and further offshore. This development triggered President Truman, the United States, in September 1945 to declare that the United States had not only sovereignty over the terrestrial resources and those in the territorial sea, but also over the natural resources of the continental shelf. It also highlights the fact that regulatory regimes now started to differentiate between the seafloor and the water column. Other states liked that idea. Because they said, well, if the United States can claim the seafloor, so can we. And states started to embrace the idea that you can actually extend your land. Within 25 years from the Truman Declaration, the International Court of Justice confirmed the legal status of the continental shelf. It was not even necessary to claim it. It belonged to the coastal state. So every coastal state automatically has jurisdiction over part of the seafloor. The court held that the continental shelf was nothing different than a submerged natural prolongation of the land. So if you own the land, you own part of the sea, and you certainly own part of the seafloor. So at the end of the 1960s, extension of coastal state sovereignty seemed to be the rule. But other paradigms were being discussed as well. We asked Dr. Ani Benham, Honorary President of the International Ocean Institute in Malta to enlighten us. In 1972, the world was on the eve of a great adventure. Elizabeth Van Borgese was at the center of momentous events. A new paradigm for the ocean was in construction. No longer Marie Libro, no longer Marie Clausen. Elizabeth was instrumental in encouraging world leaders to rethink our relationship with the ocean and our management of marine resources. The ocean community, the underprivileged, the marginalized, coastal communities called her the mother of the ocean. She inspired millions to have a worldwide view of the ocean that was landward looking and thus caring for the people and communities and in coastal villages. Elizabeth's love for the ocean was surpassed only by her commitment to peace and the well-being of humankind. She saw in the making of the Constitution of the Ocean, the Third United Nations Conference of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, the making of a new world order. She believed that the ocean should, in effect, become a laboratory for the making of that new world order. She believed the international regime for the peaceful use of the ocean is a construct to cultivate the ocean so that its power would everywhere safeguard precious life on earth. The negotiations of the new international economic order were also underway at the UN Forum and an optimistic commitment to global management through the institutions of the United Nations predominated. Elizabeth, in her action and conviction, sought a linkage between the new order and the emerging constitution of the sea. She addressed the marine revolution that was driving UNCLOS III as one of the greatest disruptors that have marked human history. She described it as a revolution in international relations, but warned there were already ominous signs of the extreme in the euphoria of the revolution. That, marine, that the marine revolution 
could turn out to be predominantly destructive. Hence, she would demonstrate her great potential for pragmatism in her stated belief that Rhodesia did not work on land, it would not work underwater. During the 1960s, studies had shown that the wealth of mineral resources at the seafloor could potentially provide the means to end world poverty. Developing states were afraid that due to the freedom of the high seas, these resources would be mined by developed states before they themselves had the capability to mine resources as well. To prevent a similar scenario than that of overfishing with regard now to mineral resources of the deep seabed, Malta proposed at the United Nations in 1967 to declare the whole ocean beyond the territorial sea the common heritage of humankind. This would mean that the ocean beyond national jurisdiction, first, should, not, should be used for peaceful purposes only, second, should not be appropriated, third, should be subject to benefit-sharing mechanisms for its resources, fourth, should be preserved for the whole humankind also for future generations, and fifth, should be governed by an international authority. The common heritage concept tried to prevent the tragedy of the commons that would be inherent to the characteristics of the freedom of the high seas on the one hand, but also the expanding jurisdiction of coastal states on the other hand. The inception of the common heritage could not prevent that many states favoured the idea of broadening the sovereign rights they enjoyed over the natural resources of the continental shelf to the water column above it. The idea behind it was that if a state has rights over, for example, fish stocks, that will make sure that this fish stock will not be overfished. In this way, the concept of the exclusive economic zone emerged in the 1970s. Some people refer to this development as the biggest land grab in history, although it's a water grab, because large parts of the ocean were formerly the freedom of the high seas before and now were subject to coastal states' sovereignty and sovereign rights over national resources. Hopes have not come true everywhere. Essentially, for the functioning of the exclusive economic zones um, would be the capability of the coastal states to enforce their laws, to have good laws and to enforce them. And not all states do possess this ability, which is um, then abused by others to overfish certain stocks in exclusive economic zones of foreign states. Both the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf regime may now extend to 200 nautical miles from the coast. That's a vast space of ocean. Technically speaking, continental shelf regimes can be extended even beyond these 200 nautical miles if a geological continental shelf exists beyond that boundary. The planting of a Russian flag on the seafloor uh, right at the North Pole is based on such an extended continental shelf claim. Coastal claims like this would ha just leave a small part of the Arctic region beyond any national jurisdiction, as uh, Denmark, via Greenland, and Canada have made uh, comparable claims. All in all, these developments result in an immense reduction of the areas beyond national jurisdiction. And we have learned that this is not necessarily better because although they are taken out this common uh, goods approach, this open access approach, it doesn't necessarily mean that states are in a position to have better governance in place. And there are more events taking place that reduce uh, the absolute freedom of the high seas. The current regime for deep seabed mining covers just mineral resources. It's unclear what the regime for marine genetic resources is. Some claim that the freedom of the high seas is applicable. Others would like to see these rich resources covered by the common heritage. The fact that only flag states can exercise jurisdiction on the high seas diminishes the possibility to proclaim marine protected areas in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Fish species that occur both in the high seas and in waters under national jurisdiction also require international agreements to prevent them from being overfished in different zones. Luckily, an increasing amount of regional fisheries management organizations try to fill this gap. Some are doing better, others are comparably weak. 
To summarize this chapter, let me refer to key messages now from the 70s, uh, 17th century onwards until now. States have always aimed either at freedom or at an extension of coastal power, accelerated technological development and consequently extended coastal jurisdiction together with governance regimes that now also cover the areas beyond national jurisdiction leads to a diminishing part of the oceans where there's freedom of the high seas that is still applicable.